All right, I have just hit the live button and we are ready to go. Hello, everybody. And Jared's walking away. This is the glories of uh, the time delay on here. Uh, so uh, let me know if uh, everything is working right on here. Why did the screen go blank? Okay, there we go. All right, we're back. Future instruments, hypothetical instruments. And I just reached out to... Um, Richard and Jared said, hey, you guys want to come on and uh, just, you know, nerd out? Richard and I did this uh, a week ago, or just a little over a week ago, where we had a nine-hour road trip, where basically we did this entire thing in the car on a road trip to Lubbock with a bucket full of crumb horns, an awful Clyde, and a Sarusophone in the car. So... All right, let's see if you guys' audio is coming through. Hello? Hello? Hey, hey. And now we wait 30 seconds before anybody <laughs> comments on that. But, all right, so I think uh, we've got right now eight people here. Um, we'll kind of open up the, the floor to any questions you have for the three of us regarding... Uh, so let me... Uh, the topic tonight kind of is... We're all kind of interested in building and developing new instruments that could be used in wind band or orchestra or chamber groups. And Richard and Jared have gone as far as to start building these instruments. And I have gone as far as to start writing for them. So we're kind of just going to brainstorm tonight and just, you know, nerd out. So any questions you guys have and we'll just kind of go from there. All right, we got confirmation. Everybody is coming through. I got this set up right on the first try. It only took like two hours of work today. So yeah, we've got saxophone man commenting, helicopter harmonics who's always here. Uh, how you doing? Um, the the Irish name I can't pronounce. I'm not going to try to. Um, so anyway, Richard first. Uh, good. <laughs> Uh, first question: How is the um, uh, the subcontrabassoon coming? Because that is going to get asked, and we just let's get it out of the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, my my uh, ever, uh, ever since, since I moved, moved my my, uh, my, uh, my YouTube, YouTube channel has has as active, as active as I would have liked. Uh, uh, it's, it's coming it's along. along. You know, you know. Uh, uh, one of, one the, of the advantages, advantages I, have I have is I'm not, I'm looking, not at looking at this, at this as, as a business, business venture. venture. I'm treating, I'm treating it, more it more as a science, science project. project. Uh, uh, so work, work happens when, when I have time, time and, and when, when I, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't feel, feel like, like I have, I have to, to you know, kill, kill myself, myself uh, to, to, work to work on it. it. But, but um, one, one thing, thing uh, 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 Something I actually have gotten, gotten a big opportunity to talk, opportunity to talk about, talk in, my, about uh, in my video uh, yet video is, yet is uh, I recently I made recently the decision, made the decision to switch over, to over um, um, so the, uh, so the, uh, the subconscious body, body joints, body there, joints. Are there are eight, eight of them, of them that, don't that don't have very, many keyword, very many keyword, or very much keyword, or very much keyword at all. At all. Um, and I made, and the, I made decision the decision to switch to 3D printing, printing for those, not to... Not because not it's because less expensive, it's less expensive, even though it is, is but because, but because uh, of the mass, uh, of the mass of production, production weight that you that can you can get from uh, the FDM printing, printing process when you print, print the perimeters with a lattice support structure on the inside. Hey, hey, uh, hey, doing, doing that, that Richard, and, yes. We're, evidently, we're getting a, a bad echo on your end. Um, no, they can't hear anything you're saying. So um, let me try something really quickly. Uh, Do you have the video open in another uh, tab in your browser? Rich, oh, say, say that again, Richard. Do you have the the, you, the video open in another tab? I, I have, have it open, open, but I have it muted. Okay. Um, let me try something I, real quick. Uh, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this and this. Okay, Richard, uh, start. Uh, talking again and we'll see if that fixes it hello 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 all right so again we're gonna have to wait a 30 second so why don't you go ahead and say what you're saying about the the changes and we'll see if that fixes it 
Uh, so uh, the, the the biggest change I've made recently is I've switched uh, over from uh, originally the plan was to do all uh, fourteen body joints out of uh, machining them out of solid Delrin. Um, and while I'm still going to do that for the, uh, the six body joints that have the most of the key work, for the uh, the eight body joints that have very sparse key work, I've decided to switch over to uh, 3D printing. Uh, not to save money, even though it does save money, uh, but for the, the massive weight reduction. Uh, Delrin is very dense. Uh, it's about half as dense as maple, whereas a 3D printed... Uh, body joint and ABS is about the same weight as maple. So, um, uh, so I think Brett actually, Brett has a subcontrabassoon body joint somewhere lying around. And I have some as well over here. They're not assembled yet though. So I actually have a question. Have you ever, um, have you considered using a PETG for printing it? Yeah, uh, so I've, I've gone back and forth. I actually made, printed an entire, all eight body joints in PLA first. Um, so this is a PLA body joint. This is the, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the twelfth body joint. Uh, this is the tone hole for C0. Um, but, uh, the problem with PLA is it doesn't, it's a little resistant to uh, adhesives. Um, so I wasn't getting quite as, it wasn't, the body joints weren't uh, bonding as well as I wanted. Uh, since I don't have a 3D printer capable of printing 600 millimeters, I have to print it in three segments. Um, the reason I went with ABS, uh, these are three of the segments is because it can be chemically bonded and it essentially it, it becomes for most practical purposes a single piece of plastic uh petg doesn't quite accomplish the same thing um it's a lot easier to print than abs the, the big downside to abs is that abs is a pain to print uh luckily uh you have to you have to keep it warm. You have to really have a, a heated bed. Um, but I was able to print it in the garage in the middle of the summer and with a heated enclosure to keep it like at uh, 40 degrees Celsius. And uh, I got all the parts printed before winter. So that's good. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Because um, God, I started printing uh, like seven years ago. And I think back then the only two options were like, yeah, like PLA and ABS. Mm-hmm. And- I couldn't. I and just a lot. Had, lot I just had yeah. like, like three hundred dollar printers, and so I just did uh, PLA, but I was never really happy with the results, so I just kind of moved on to different machining options. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know that's that's the important thing about three D printing is it's not a replacement for uh, more traditional manufacturing op- uh, options. There are things that it's good at, and then the things that it's really not good at, and it can complement, you know, more uh, what we would think as, as of as more traditional machine work, like lathe work, mill work, uh, or if you're lucky to have CNC mill or CNC lathe, uh, without needing to replace it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, in, in my situation, what it allowed me to do is uh, make it up so it's a, a lattice of plastic. With a with a shell around the outside, rather than a solid block of plastic, which um, r- nearly cut in half the uh, uh, the the weight of those body joints. Yeah. So that that was my main deciding factor, not uh, not the uh, not the relative ease or the expense. What I'll say is, you know, I've I've got the uh, the Newton joint and. I am uh, shocked at how light it is. Well, and see, and that's the PLA one. So the the ABS one's actually lighter. Wow, that's. Uh, 
So, yeah, so if it's lighter than that, that's a really smart move to get those in the 3D printed material. And you said it's it's done basically on a lattice work. Uh, so is it not is uh, completely solid? No, no. So, I mean, you can print it entirely solid. And I've done that before. Uh, hold on a second. This is my big bag of crumb horn parts uh, for some crumb horns that I designed and haven't quite printed yet. When I uh, printed these bodies for the, the crumb horns, this is the, the body for the F Sopranino crumb horn, uh, I used what's called a 100% infill, which means it is completely solid. It takes a long time to print, but that means that I have... Um, uh, I have a lot of flexibility to resize these tone holes. I don't have to worry about uh, breaking through the perimeters. Usually on FDM printing, you don't print 100% infill. You would print something like 15 or 20%, 30% if you really want robustness. Um, and that's just to save plastic. Uh, because when you're building something layer by layer, there's no need for it to be... 100% solid. And as a result, the ABS joints printed in that fashion are uh, about the same weight as a wooden joint would be, uh, a maple joint. Um, Sorry, I, I am switching over to you using my, my tablet here. Uh, just... Um, to uh, make, can I do that even? Eh. Anyway, so uh, so most of the time when you're 3D printing, it it's not going to be fully filled in. Yeah. And that's a pretty easy setting to do on the 3D printer. Yeah. Uh, that's Although I will say when I, uh, whenever I make uh, barrels and stuff, like uh, recently, I think the most recent thing I printed was like an extension, kind of like uh, the Phobes E flat extension with clarinet. I usually just always use 100% infill just because I feel it gives it more strength. But I think for something mm -hmm. as large as the subcontrapersoon, it makes sense to have a like a reduced infill or like a honeycomb uh, pattern inside. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, we've got on this. Not really kind of why we're here. Uh, Get with your teacher on that. Do um, you think there's any room in the orchestra for a new choir? Or do you think only new instruments could be added to already existing choirs? Well, I know my opinion. <laughs> uh, I know your opinion, too. And I know you want a cylindrical bore uh, double reed instrument. Well, <laughs> I, I think there... There has to be a good a distinction here between what do we want and what do we think. True. It because the way I look at the saxophone is a wildly successful instrument that never nevertheless does not have a standard spot in the orchestra. Um, and it's hard for me to imagine an entire a woodwind a new woodwind choir being built that was more successful than the saxophone to the point where it can establish itself in the orchestra. That doesn't mean I don't want people to try. I'd love to see it happen. But if the saxophone didn't do it, it's, it's hard for me to, to see it happening. Uh, I, I'll agree there. Um, that said, the saxophone is not accepted in the orchestra for reasons other than the tone of the saxophone. It's, it's almost a political reason at this point. And, you know, well, it's it's political and historical. I mean, there's just so much of what you do in a day to day orchestra is not uh, it's not new music. It's oh, yeah. older music. And yeah. uh, how much you'd have to get to the point where there's so much repertoire for this instrument that it's worth having like an addition to spot for this new choir, these new players. And like I said, I'd love to see it happen, but 
I, 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 I wouldn't it's, bet it's, on it my last time. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen in the orchestra. I think you have a better chance of it happening in the wind band than in the orchestra because wind bands tend to be more flexible and more adventurous to an extent. Um, you know, that's why wind bands have the full section of saxophones and orchestras don't. I think the only way we'll really see it is if we get not like a new uh, a new instrument, something that's more of a replacement for something that already exists. Like, for example, like let's say the uh, the contraforte does successfully replace the contrabassoon. Um, do, and then I guess that brings up the question: Does that count as an entirely new instrument? I mean, that's and that's I, up for debate. But I don't think it does. I've always been under the impression that the contraforte is simply a redesigned contrabassoon that is has more acoustically correct tone holes and a slightly larger bore size. It's not too. I mean, if you look at all the different iterations of contrabassoon through the centuries. There's more difference between the contrabassoons that were used in the 1800s from the time of Beethoven to the time of Brahms, even, than there is between the modern contrabassoon and the modern contraforte. Well, let's imagine like something hypothetically that's so different than some existing instrument that it's, and of course improves on it, that, it's, that it could be considered its own instrument. That's the only situation I could really see. Like maybe this new instrument hypothetically would be used alongside the existing instrument that's trying to replace, where the question, would it replace it eventually, or would it be a new complementary uh, family of instruments that is used in the orchestra? That's really the only uh, foreseeable situation where I, I see that happening. In, in, in this case, this is, this is the most important thing to realize. Any instrument has to first serve a function. If there's no function, the instrument will die away very quickly. I think we saw this really kind of with the, the serusophone family. The contrabass serusophone filled a function and was used until that function got superseded by an improved um, French contrabassoon. And at that point... Improved. It, well, considering what it was before, I mean, the French yeah, contrabassoon yes. before was still, still like an eight-key instrument. Yeah, no, 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 I... I, I joke it it was an improvement it the contrabassoon is still not taken nearly as seriously enough or as seriously from manufacturers as it deserves to be but yes all right um let's see um another question we've got here um all right, let's kind of stop, guys, in the, the chat room with uh, anything about practicing the saxophone. There are better places to discuss that, um, and I can't keep up with all of it. Uh, yeah, this is where we're going to discuss serious things like the Giga Racket. Yes, oh, yeah, the, the serious of all instruments. <laughs> Notice the, those two guys both have giant PVC instruments sitting behind them. Okay, I'm sure mine's in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh here here is a, a a serious question for richard how did the octa keys work on the sub contrabassoon well on, on any reed instrument the the octave vents are an acoustic compromise and generally they're not it's not a compromise that's determined beforehand by a bunch of math it's a compromise determined by trial and error. You know, you build the instrument and then you you see what's the absolute minimum number of octave vents that you can get away with, and then you use that number. Um, so right now, the plan is for a very straightforward uh, contrabassoon style system where you have uh, an automatic octave vent that activates when you open the... Uh, when you lift off the first finger, when you have the second finger down, so it kind of functions like the half hole mechanism on a contra bassoon. Um, and then you have two independent octave keys, each of which opens two coupled octave vents. Um, and I'm going to start from there because it's kind of the simplest solution that I think has a chance of being adequate. Um, it's, I consider it, you know, the larger the instrument gets, the the uh, 
usually the more octave vents you need. Uh, you can see this very clearly with the clarinet family, where the normal B flat or A clarinet has one octave vent that also, uh, in the case of the clarinet, it's a register vent. Um, you have one register vent that also serves as a tone hole for the instrument. It does all of that. Whereas it's, as you get to the lower instruments in the family, the bass and the contrabass, you need more octave vents just to do the same job. Um, contrabassoon has more octave vents. Well, bassoon is a whole, the, the octave vent yeah. situation on bassoon is a mess. This, this is a, a case whole, where... Whole other thing. This is a case where I actually think the contrabassoon's octave system is far superior to the bassoon's. It's mechanically superior. It doesn't work as well. True. It's not um, as nuanced. It's not as nuanced. Yeah. A so flat. anyway, uh, long story short, I want to prove that this kind of straightforward contrabassoon style system doesn't work before tackling something more complex. I mean, in an ideal situation, every pitch that's played as a second harmonic would have an octave vent. Um, that, but that's just not practical. Um, so the process of finding exactly how many I could get away with um, is going to be kind of, is I anticipate going to be up to trial and error. All right, let's see. What else do we got in the way of questions on here? Um, our saxophone man has been silenced uh, for a while. He could rejoin if he's going to take the chat seriously. This is not a private lesson for him. Um, as an alto ophicleide player, I would like my instrument to replace all alto horns. I don't think that's going to happen. The ophicleide family had its chance. It did. It did not survive. I could I could make an argument for the bass off of Clyde being used for effects, uh, certain uh, interesting passages, but not as a regular instrument. Um, let's see. Is the subcontra bassoon meant to be a serious instrument in the sense that it can produce the lowest tones of a contra in a more natural and well-sounding way? Because the contra doesn't really sound perfect there. That's uh, that's a loaded question because I've, yeah, I mean it's definitely something I'm taking seriously. Um, and to answer the next question, I I'm viewing it as a uh, sub contra bassoon. I'm modeling it on. I'm designed it to be analogous to the bassoon in the se or to the contra bassoon in the same sense that the Bassoon or contrabassoon is analogous to the bassoon. Um, yes, I, I take the instrument seriously. I think it fills a useful role. I think that composers they do write down in that register, in the thirty-two foot register. It's yeah. just they don't have any other option than to use the organ, which is usually not available. Or a synthesizer. Um, however, I. One of the benefits of this being a um, uh, a science or a science project for me, rather than a business venture, is I'm prepared to be proven wrong. If I build it and the results are disappointing or, or impractical, well, we still learn. We still know more. We have more information than we did when I started. So that. That's got to be the goal. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not some business guy who's going to try to trump up the, the, uh, the value of an instrument without proof. I'm just a guy wanting to to prove it and being prepared to do wrong or be wrong. Yeah, there's a question on here. How much will it cost? And I'm going to venture to say you have no clue because it's not going to be for sale anytime soon. And, well, the the prototype's not playable yet, and until you get a playable prototype, finalizing a price is just not not a smart idea. Way too many Kickstarters have made that mistake. Yeah. Um, let's see. Brad asks, what about making a bassoon with keys instead of tone holes or make it with a berm system? A uh, bassoon with a berm system has been tried. It didn't work. Uh, part of what makes the bassoon's... Uh, 
characteristic tone is its imperfections. And once you start taking away those imperfections, uh, it doesn't sound like a bassoon anymore. It's one of those weird things. You make it more perfect and it sounds worse. Or it sounds less like what you think it should. Would you agree there, Richard? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I think that's part of the like the reason why the the bass so forte failed too. Yeah, that, so yeah, if you don't know, Wolf uh, made a bass so forte one octave higher than the contraforte, and uh, it was an interesting experiment. And for a while, there's a sound sample of it on the internet, and it did not sound good. Um, as much as I, I love Wolf and his manufacturing, uh, it was not a, it was not the right direction. Oh, well, and it and it's also it's it's a big ask because you're you're starting from an instrument that has literal centuries of trial and error of practice put into it. I mean, the number of people that have devoted their lives to Im making slight improvements on bassoon reeds. When you build a new instrument, you're kind of starting over from scratch, um, and you don't don't have any of that benefit. So. I mean, I, I think I, I agree with you that I am. I think Wolf is one of those few companies out there that's actually doing some of this innovation that the double read world, in particular, has been very hesitant in. And you know, I certainly don't know enough about the Basso Forte to say that it um, can't be a good instrument or effective. But I, I do agree that the the what I've heard of it was not terribly impressive, but then again, without the benefit of reads, with, uh, of uh, decades of read making experience, without the benefits of uh, decades of long tone practice and scales practice, it it's it's hard. I wonder to, if that that could be. It, it that... would be hard for any instrument. Uh, I, w I wonder if that's some of the objection to to the contraforte among a lot of contrabassoon players is that it is different from their normal setup and it's a different read entirely. And so it doesn't feel as comfortable. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't played that much on the, the contraforte. Uh, it's uh I'll, I'll be honest, I prefer the sound of a well-played contrabassoon to that of a well-played contraforte, but there are many people, many of whom have much more illustrious careers than I do, that feel the opposite way, and uh, I think it comes down to a matter of taste. I do kind of agree with you, though, that it's a subtype of contrabassoon rather than a completely new instrument. I certainly don't want to see the contrabassoon repertoire kind of balkanized the same way that the bass oboe repertoire has become uh, fractured with the all you know all these little hecklephone versus bass oboe versus lupophone wars yeah uh, so yeah we we talked about that quite a bit and it's been brought up kind of in the the idrs facebook page recently on that too um, yeah I, I think i was obnoxious in that as well uh, you were you were obnoxious though in a way that was trying to provoke a serious conversation that needs to be had. So I I so, don't actually see it as obnoxious really. So he, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna expose myself as kind of a, a bad YouTuber here, um, in that I watch YouTube. I mainly watch like brain dead, you know video game let's play is to fall asleep so what i'd what i want to hear more about is the uh the the clarinet back behind us there oh right back behind jared there okay yeah yeah, so... let's, yeah jared's kind of been silent for too long because everybody's asking about subcontra but we need to have a an octo contra there we go yeah so um so i think i talked about this in one of my uh, previous live streams so uh since the last like progress update i made on this uh, I've installed a few more keys. I'm up to the uh, the open G key on a clarinet, so I can play about an octave and a a little bit extra. There, there's yeah, that's, still... that's like the range of an oboe. <laughs> oh, burn yeah, right. against oboes. And I also I, love the oboe. <laughs> I also installed the, uh, a registered 
bent on the instrument so that I could uh, play the upper half of the uh, clarion register. And surprisingly, um, so what I did to find the location of the register vent was I, um, I kind of uh, interpolated from the uh, position of the register vent on my contrabass clarinet. And I kind of just uh, picked a, uh, the same size, the same internal diameter, and then I just varied the length to tune it. And I'm surprised to find it actually works really well. Uh, so that's good. That was one thing I was kind of worried about trying to play the upper register on this instrument, whether it would come out good. Um, this, so, so do you find that that, that what range, over what range does that one octave vent or that one register vent work effectively? I know, you, I know you can't play the, the full range of the instrument yet, but, uh, so that's actually, an, that's actually an interesting question. Let me, uh, let me actually demonstrate that. Uh, let me just grab a read. So the interesting thing about register vents on clarinet is, um, despite what many people think you actually don't need, um, like two or three vents on a clarinet this large. Um, in fact, the the, uh, the LeBlanc contrabass clarinet that my college uh, owned only had one single register vent for a contrabass oh, wow. clarinet. Wow. Yeah. So it is possible to make a big clarinet with a one register vent, but what you actually have to do is um, on the neck of the instrument, you have to make the diameter smaller than the rest of the instrument, and that brings the octaves back into tune, and it helps with the harmonics. On this instrument, I'm not going to do that because I don't know if I can accurately uh, replicate that design, but I'm using two register vents where one of them doubles as the uh, the, the B-flat throat vent, just like on a, um, a, bass, a professional bass clarinet. But uh, yeah, so let me show you. So this, in, this vent is optimized so that I can play the notes, um, let's see, E through, uh, I guess, all the way up into the Alfissimo. So it, same thing as like the upper vent on a bass clarinet. <laughs> See if I can play this. And then if I try to play below E, I can kind of let the notes out, but uh, because the vent is not optimized for those notes, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're hard to play. So let me try and play it down to a, a clarion B. So when I get to that B, it kind of just uh, breaks. And the reason, because of that, um, in order to make a vent that's optimized for a specific um, range of the uh, the upper register, you actually can make it bigger. And uh, making the internal diameter of the vent bigger makes um, whatever range you've optimized easier to play, but it means that you can't really go outside that range. So like mm -hmm. on that uh, LeBlanc contrabass I was talking about where it's only one single vent, it's just one tiny little vent, like the same size as a B-flat clarinet. But because it's so small, it allows you to play the whole upper range on one single vent. So, um, it's but, kind but of see, that's, uh, oh, sorry. that's kind of the problem though with the regular bassoon is we have, you know, the whisper key vent, which kind of works for the entire second register. But of course, if, if you're a serious bassoonist, you know that it doesn't work well enough. You can slur through that register by just opening that one tiny vent. But if you want to strongly articulate something in that register, you want a, a larger, more accurately positioned vent. And like you were saying, you're probably going to need more than one of them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's kind of what on, separates... I was going to say, to Sorry, piggyback on that, um, I was talking with uh, Jason Alder... Uh, uh, yesterday, and he's doing his doctoral work on contrabass clarinet and the history of it. And he was saying that the very first LeBlanc paper clips from 1935 actually had four register vents. Uh, when they went into production with the Model 340, and we think about 1964 was the, the first real production year on those, they had reduced it to one or two. Uh, so sometime between 35 and about 60 or 64, they reduced it from four to one or two. Yeah, I remember. I remember the the B flat paper clip that I tried to tried to work on once. Uh, I, I was supposed to play it in a concert, and the the lower clarion register you just couldn't articulate whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It had multiple octave vents, but one of them are the the vent that was supposed to work in the lower register just was not uh, placed or sized appropriate for that function. And so just because it has more than one octave vent doesn't mean they work. Yeah. 
All right, so... And those, we, uh, oh, uh, go ahead, Jared. Yeah, the, the vents on uh, the LeBlancs are also really finicky, too, because um, on my contrabase, it, it, th- it has the two plus one system, I like to call it. So two register vents plus a tone hole for throw B flat. But what this the problem with this is that there's just so many linkages and mechanisms that try to close and open those uh, pads at different times that it, it, it one little misadjustment and it ruins the whole thing. All right, we've got a whole bunch of questions that I'd like to get to. Uh, if your question is not answered, go ahead and ask it again. I'll try and get to them. I'm just going to go here from the bottom. Um, uh, what are your opinions on John Williams' bassoon concerto? Uh, I love it personally. Uh, I, it was the centerpiece of my big graduate recital, so I spent a year and a half learning that piece. Um I don't know. Do you know it well, Richard? You know, I I, I really don't. Uh, my my solo uh, work is pretty these days is pretty contra focused. Uh, I I love John Williams' music. I I think he's one of a frustratingly small number of populated popular film composers that writes for woodwinds well. I, um, he's one of the last composers to really write for woodwinds at all, and the rest are just kind of forced into it. Yeah, it's like, well, this is this is an orchestra, so I guess I gotta have some some doodly bits for the flutes and have the trombone line doubled by the bassoon. But all right, so let's but. See. Uh, um. All right, so what else do we have? We have, um, would you advocate for an orchestra containing all members of all the traditional instrument families? It would make for an interesting experiment. Um, The uh, only time I really know of an orchestral piece doing that is Havergal Bryan's Gothic Symphony. Uh, Even then, he leaves out the saxophones because he called them that bastard instrument. Um... It only if they serve a function. I I would say on that. Um, I, I guess where I would go with it would be more focusing on woodwinds for a sec for a second. It would be great if someone could write for an orchestral woodwind section and rely upon the different woodwind all of the different woodwinds being available. Uh Without, without necessarily the expectation that they would need to use them for every single piece. Um, yeah. So, for instance, the flute section of four flutes, but each flute player has multiple flutes, so you're not using, you know, you're not having somebody on bass flute sitting there and only uh, uh, playing for a few minutes in a whole piece. It makes more yeah, sense. Yeah, or doubling. pointlessly doubling a whole bunch of, you know, horn lines that no one's ever going to hear. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, I do think there's value to having a, uh, a more co- co- uh, concise section. You know, like, when you start getting into these quadruple woodwind sections are larger... It, it does start to feel like a less cohesive section. Um, and if you say that, okay, I have to have every size of flute and every size of oboe and all the saxophones and some sarusophones and all of that, you're getting into like a, an, an all-state band all of a sudden, and it, it stops feeling like an orchestra. You know, I, I do think that part of writing for uh, orchestral woodwinds is keeping in mind that kind of core eight or 12 people. Um, you know, the, either the, the pairs or the pairs plus the auxiliaries. And then yes, adding in people um, as necessary beyond that. But um, I, I don't know that I'd advocate for an orchestra that by default had like, 30 woodwinds no or, it, or the, a, a number that you'd need in order to have every family represented in every size and to be able to play all together 
you lose your flexibility at that point. And it, it, it becomes something too large to move. It's my 600 pound life. Mm. Uh, but Richard, you had a, an idea that you posted months ago, maybe even a year ago that I still think would be an absolutely brilliant idea. You take your standard uh, woodwind section of 12 players and augment that with an extra four. And those four are woodwind doublers. So they can play, mm. you know, saxophone or an auxiliary clarinet or auxiliary flute. And that way you can add in any one of those four players to the other sections, or you can have a saxophone section, or it, and it just becomes much, much more flexible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I also don't think it'll ever happen. <laughs> no, but. it's not. It's not going to ever happen in an orchestra, unless you have like one of the top composers out there getting major commissions who does it. And but, I think but that's only even then. Even then, being behind the scenes in an orchestra, they're they're just going to hire an extra flute player, an extra clarinet player, and dedicated saxophone players. Right. You would have <laughs> yeah. to have a, spe a specific ensemble. Uh, dedicated yes. to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Um, what are your or thoughts on the double euphonium and B-flat and F currently being produced by the Bach Instrument Company? A double euphonium is just what we call a, a compensating euphonium. That's what all professional euphonium players use. Uh, Richard and whoever else, could you elaborate more on the idea of a family of cylindrical double reed instruments and the role it would fill? I think that's that's a, a Richard question, although... Uh, well, it's also a cylindrical yeah. in, in, yeah. Uh, question as well. Yeah. Um, go yeah, ahead. I, mean, I actually have uh, tried to make one of those in the past, so um, nice. I, I, I'm terrible at making reeds, so I kind of just used like a, I like tried making reeds out of plastic, and I had a uh, instrument that was made out of a like quarter inch PVC pipe, and it, um, the, the problem I found with it is that it's more of a, the issue with it is volume, so as much as the clarinet is bad at a, at a projection compared to instruments like the saxophone, a double reeded instrument with a small bore, like you would expect, like a kind of like the oboe versus the saxophone, just has issues with projection. And of mm -hmm. course, the way to solve that is you just make the bore bigger. But when you do that, you end up with something that just sounds so similar to a clarinet, like a like a de duke. Or I don't know if you've ever seen. Um, there's a Chinese instrument called the uh, I believe it's pronounced like Wanzi. That's uh, it's basically a clarinet with a full verm system keyword, but with a double reed. And they do have a pretty distinct sound, but they sound pretty similar to the clarinet, depending on like the uh, the armature you would use. So, I guess it depends. Like, what kind of niche would you be trying to fill with a double uh, reeded cylindrical instrument? So, where I come, go ahead. I didn't say. I didn't say oh, nope. oh, sorry. I thought I heard something. Uh, so, where where I come at it from is that you know, there's so much there's so much music that's been written for. Uh, cylindrical double reeds over the years um and you know just in the same way that recorder repertoire is now open and available to flute players to play it on you know not the not the historical instrument but an instrument with a similar timbre and a fully modern uh system uh keep our fully modern mechanism you know i do think there would be value in filling in that one last quadrant of the, the the reed world right we have the mm -hmm. we have the conical single reeds the conical double reeds and we have the cylindrical single reeds but the cylindrical uh, double reeds have kind of been consigned to this you know early music uh uh box and i i just think it's a fantastic sound you know uh, you talked about limited projection and i completely agree uh but just like, you know, the low register of the flute, it's a beautiful register. You have to score for it appropriately. That's one of the composer's jobs. If a composer wanted to use a modern crumhorn uh, uh, variant with, you know, chromatic key, uh, keyworks system, it would need to be scored for appropriately com considering its, um, its uh, limitations in that regard. Whether or not composers would 
do that or just, you know, write it fortissimo and then yell at the player, who knows? Chances are the composer just wouldn't write for it at all. Yeah. Um, but I, the, yeah. I think the best example, though, there is what you recently played. You did uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And, um, you know, there's an important quasi crumb horn part in there, which is why you have your instrument out now. Um, but uh, they were used. I, actually, we don't know exactly what instrument they used on the the original recording. Uh, but you know, you know, now that I about, now that I think about it, I think what what do you think? It, Rausch Pfeifen. could be. They made a uh, Merck at one point made a made a Sopranino Rausch Pfeifen, uh, uh up in that register. Ah, you know what? It could be. Um, I mean. That would make sense. Um, but uh, I, I think there is potential room for a cylindrical double reed instrument. Uh, you'd fit it basically with quasi-clarinet keyword. So the I guess just kind of like the, the Guanzi that you talked about from China, Jared. Uh, okay. Um, Pivot on Rotor... But... Oh. If any of you are out there independently wealthy and are looking for an investment, I do have to say I wouldn't recommend in he heavily investing in a family of cylindrical double reed instruments, just from a purely financial point of view. Well, from like a band nerd point of view, I would definitely like to see that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Would, there, 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 be... There's a lot of things we... In a lot of these conversations, when you're talking about you know building new instruments, designing new instruments, you have to kind of separate the "I want this to happen" versus "Does it need to happen?" Does yeah, yeah. It, yeah. is there a market for it? And right. thankfully, I'm not a business person, so I don't have to worry too much about the market. But I do think it's worth you know mentioning mentioning as I talk about some of my crazy ideas. You know that there are some that I do think have potential if everything goes right like i do think there's potential in a 32 foot woodwind uh i do think that that fills a useful role um and could catch on whereas there are other ideas that would just make me happy but i don't actually see i if i go if i were to go forward in the future 30 years i don't see my high school or high school bands starting kids on modern crumb horns. I'll put it that way. No, no. I think you might could see it in a professional group, uh, but I don't see it as an, in an educational setting. All right. Let's see if I can get to some of these questions in here. Um, uh, do you, uh, Brett, do you happen to know why the horn takes up the alto role in the wind band yet? It's ba most basic form is technically a, bass instrument um it's not a bass instrument it has the same length as bass instruments uh but um um it, it would be like if you had a clarinet and you permanently uh or took the register key off so that it was all, always open. You could argue that it's like an alto or a tenor instrument, but practically speaking, you've you put it in the upper register permanently. Like the, the, the horn is not designed to play in the fundamental register whatsoever. No, no. Like, I, I've heard people do it. Sarah Willis with Barely. the Berlin Philharmonic is a great example, but she is so rare and so specialized that we can't use her as the basic. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Um, all right. So you were based. So let's go ahead and move on. And you were basically saying uh, th that we can dream all we want um, about uh, these potential instruments, but they first have to fill the function. So what instruments do we, um, can we envision that would fill a, a function and, and then could there be a market for them? I, I think uh, both of the instruments you guys are building have a, a very specific function and there could be a market for them. Yeah, because, you know, kind of the, when you're, 
brainstorming a new instrument, kind of the, the easiest thing to do is say, okay, bigger or smaller. You know, like if all you had was the bass clarinet and the clarinet, like that, if that was the whole family and you're thinking, well, where do we go from here? You're probably going to go with either lo- or a contra or an E flat rather than trying to put something in the middle there. Um, so, yeah, it, it's easier to justify something that can do uh, something that nothing, no, no other instrument in the family can do as opposed to something that has a subtly distinctive tone color in the middle. Yeah, because I, I think it's like we've, we've like reached a point where, like in history, where we have an instrument to fill most needs. Like, um, so what I'm trying to say is like uh, we have instruments that have been developed from the beginning of music to now, where we have a if you need an instrument that projects, it's a woodwind. You have a saxophone, something with a good range. You have a clarinet. Like a lot of niches are filled. So we have these families of instruments that have already been developed for hundreds or really even thousands of years. So it makes sense to we really are not we're really not going to make anything that's new. So it makes sense to try and expand the families that we have now, both to the upper end and the lower end, because it's not only the easiest thing to do, but it's something that hasn't been tried yet. Just because, well, uh, machining and uh, manufacturing have reached a point where we can do that now, whereas maybe 100, 200 years ago we couldn't. Uh, yeah, and and so in that regard, you know. It, it's kind of like the subtle difference between a basset horn and an alto clarinet. Uh, you know, most people aren't going to notice the difference. Yeah, and I would still argue the biggest difference between the alto horn... Sorry, <laughs> the alto <laughs> horn and the, the basset, cl- basset clarinet... No, that, that's, that's not right. Uh, like, if you're talking about, like, a, a large bore basset horn... Like, we accept large bore basset horns as a type of basset horn, Right. The largest difference between a large bore basset horn and an alto clarinet is where the break between the clarion re- register and the uh, throat register is. I mean, it's it's incredibly subtle, and it's probably more subtle than the the natural distinct our variations you're going to get just from instrument to instrument. Uh, in that case, because they are so close together. Right, yeah. and, and Jared is is much more expert on this because. Uh, what basset horn do you have right now, Jared? So that, that kind of brings up the whole point of like the, uh, the small bore versus large bore basset horn debate. And if you really ask me, there's nothing that's really, I would consider a true small bore basset horn that's manufactured today. Um, because the problem is with, uh, with Burham system key work, the whole point of Burham system key work is that the venting is optimized and the, the, essentially the whole instrument is optimized to give it a clear tone. So like uh, what we what would be a true small bore basset horn that would actually have a distinct sound from the alto clarinet would be something like the old classical and uh, romantic era basset horns where we had both a small bore and small tone holes. Um, those instruments actually have a much more distinctive sound. Like if you listen to recordings of the hist- period instruments, they, they sound much more distinct than uh, they sound distinct from the alto clarinet. And that's kind of something I want to, one of my projects I'm working on now is uh, creating a, uh, a small bore basset horn with berm system keyword. But with um, instead of actually, I'm kind of like going back. I'm instead of optimizing the uh, the tonal positions for better venting, I'm actually uh, de-optimizing them so that it gives it a more like, muted, uh, uh, reedy sound. De-optimization sounds like you're trying to turn it into a bassoon. <laughs> sounds like you're trying <laughs> well, to pretty much, make I mean, your hard drive. <laughs> I mean, yeah, pretty much. I mean, the whole. I mean, it was going back to the point where you. Uh, I forget it was making it, but you were saying that. Uh, the, the bassoon has this distinct uh, tone color because of its um, if it's a uh, small tone holes and it's uh, unoptimized bore and it's uh, the whole whisper key mess. So if I, I'm, what I want to do is create something like that for a basset horn that's more appropriate to play classical and uh, romantic music on. But I think uh, I think I just kind of of missed uh, Brett. Was your question what instrument do I play? Uh, yeah. Wh- well, which ki- what kind of basset horn do you have? I forgot. So I have a, um, I basically tried to find the closest um, instrument to what a classical basset horn would be. And what I found was the, um, mine is a 1967 Buffet basset horn, which is originally based off an instrument by uh, Boozy & Co. from 1900, 
which is pretty close to what the romantic bass and horns would be. And of course, that does mean it has some problems. So like the uh, the intonation and the lower uh, bass set range was just completely off. I had to do a lot of tuning there, which is, again, something that's been carried over from the older instruments. And then the bore, it's a, it's a small bore, so it's like 15.6 millimeter. And then the, again, the tone holes are de-optimized. So you'll have some notes that are stuffy and out of tune, which of course, for a modern instrument, that's no good. But for a basset horn, that's kind of what it's supposed to be. At least if you're playing Mozart. But if you're playing Richard yeah. Strauss, uh, you kind of want that more flexibility. Yeah. Well, and it also depends on who the who the uh, people sitting next to you, what instruments they're playing. If they're playing modern boom system, you know, clarinets manufactured 20 years ago, you probably want something that feels more like a you know, a, a large bore alto clarinet than what you're talking about. But if you're sitting next to people on period instruments, if you're sitting next to people who are also using, you know, forked fingerings or, you know, this uh, kind of mean tone or purposefully not equal tempered tuning, uh, then yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the, the mentality of most clarinetists. That's why the uh, I think the most popular basset horns today are the uh, well before they stop uh, before they stop manufacturing them the little blancs, but now the uh, the modern uh, buffet basset horns they use an alto clarinet mouthpiece and a medium large bore. So they, I mean, it, the kind of the problem with that is it kind of makes it redundant with the alto clarinet already existing. I feel that the basset horn should be a distinct instrument, but I guess clarinetists they want something that rejects. So it kind of well. It, Let's face it, clarinetists want something that's not an E flat. Yeah. <laughs> that's their number one concern. As long as it's not an E flat, well, they're happy. That that brings up the point. Why is the high F clarinet it non existent? Yeah. Okay, so Eric has asked this question three or four times. What do you think of the clarinets becoming a permanent member of the woodwinds of the orchestra? Eric, they've been a permanent member of the orchestra since about seventeen seventy. Uh, they're not going away. Most orchestra player orchestras carry three or four clarinet players. I, I don't know why you think they're not permanent. I think what and he's that, asking that, is like, when are we, or sorry. I think what he's asking is, when we're are we going to see like a uh, like a whole woodwind section, like we see a string section with dozens and dozens of players? I at least I think that that's how I'm interpreting your question. I don't think we need that just because it, they just overpower the violins. And yeah. The strings. Well, what I have to say as a bassoonist, um, both flute players and clarinet players, they're uh, interlopers in what should be a double reed world. Well, just... in, in the orchestra, remember, half of the woodwind section is double reeds. And I think a lot of, a lot of people forget that, that you know, 50% of woodwinds are double reeds. When you see a band, what is it, 10% maybe? If, if that. Yeah. I, re I remember once I was doing a, an all, uh, a, a band camp over the summer. And for, for some reason, they ended up with five bassoons in the top band. And I, I walked by the, the woodwind sectional wood. And it was like, oh, the bassoons, you can, they're doing something important. Yeah. You know, because now they're all, they're all of a sudden on equal footing with the flutes. You know, it's not that they have to overwhelm. It's just that, you know, you're already dealing, especially in the case of the bassoon, not so much the oboe. You're dealing with a, an instrument with limited projection. And to say, to also say, okay, you have less projection, so we're going to only have one of you. And then we're going to put you in unison with the trombones, the euphoniums, the bass clarinets, and the tenor saxes. And then we're going to yell at you for not projecting enough. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what you're supposed to do about that. I, I don't either. Hey, blame the band director. Don't blame the bassoonist. Band directors do not understand balance uh, for by and large. And I think it's mostly because they, I don't think it's really taught in, in colleges uh, a proper balance of the section. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was a music ed major for about six months, so I, I'm not, I'm not the best judge on what was and wasn't taught. Um, 
I know that for me, the idea of spending half of my life dealing with marching band was just not not something I personally would have enjoyed. All right, so um, let's see. Let let's um, let's talk about actual hypothetical instruments that we could foresee using, and I think let's just kind of go through the the various families of. Uh, we'll stick with woodwinds tonight because none of us are brass um, players. I mean, I just wrote the book on brass, but um, yeah, we can talk about that some other time. I may find a, a brass player to do that. Today. Hey, I have I have a serpent back there. I'll have you. Know. I can't play it, but do you have one? You probably have yeah, a trombone have a trumpet. sitting around too. You know, the funny thing is one of my orchestras just started talking about repertoire for a coming season, and I, I saw on there that there was a piece listed for uh, two bassoons and serpent. I was like, oh, no, do I actually have to practice that thing? Uh, what Was it Rienzi? Uh, I am not at liberty to go any into any more detail than that. Okay. Well, I mean, you're pretty limited. I mean, it's it's yeah. either like Rienzi or I'm Faust Overture or something like that. Uh, okay, so um, uh, let's see. Let's start with uh, clarinets. What uh, hypothetically? What you know, are there sizes of clarinets that could be added, created, improved upon? Obviously, there are, we can improve on any of them but yeah clarinets are kind of difficult because they, they've gotten to the point where there's just so many members of the clarinet family i mean i think we have pretty much have a clarinet in almost every key uh clarinets all the way from the octo contrabass all the way up to piccolo clarinet um well going along those lines i think the the one instrument i could potentially see that might have some value is a, a b flat uh i guess you would like sop sopranissimo clarinet uh, piccolo clarinet um I mean, I, I did a recent video where I talked about how they, they have existed in the past, but um, due to uh, the whole size problem where people just can't fit their fingers on them, they're kind of an impractical instrument. Although one way I could, I could see a way around that is um, the problem with most piccolo clarinets, the A-flat clarinets, is that they're designed like a small clarinet. Um, if you look at like a, a clarinet versus a bass clarinet, the, most of the a lot of the keys are completely different. They're they're optimized so that the the, the finger spread is comfortable. Um, so what you'd have to do on a piccolo clarinet is basically redesign the key work from a from scratch, with the with the major focus being ergonomics. Um, like so, something I would do is I would probably have like a plateau keys that are offset, um, so that you can instead of trying to bunch three and three fingers together you can spread your fingers more, it's more comfortable. And uh, once you do that, the whole instrument just starts to become uh, more easier to play. So uh, I think uh, something like that could potentially be an instrument we could potentially see in the future and may even have some uses. Uh, other than that, I don't yeah. really see any... We'll... Oh, sorry, go ahead. What were you say? Oh, no, 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 I was just gonna say that, you know, we always think about kind of the, the modern developments in manufacturing and design as enabling larger instruments but it could just as easily go in the other direction you know that kind of intricate complicated uh, key work necessary for large instruments could just as easily be applied to allow uh, instruments with tone holes that are more close closer together than uh, than human fingers would be comfortable with anyway at, sorry at, go ahead at that same yeah. point though we do run into the, the limiting factor of how high how high can the reed vibrate? You know, you you know, you start getting diminishing diminishing returns. Like Well, you know. I'd actually argue the bigger diminishing or the bigger limitation is, you know, the the smaller one of the advantages that I, I have come at the uh, on the, the design aspect uh, is that, you know, I've spent several years in a real or in a machine shop um and uh, jared i i think you know you, you're also in this you know world where you have a lot of experience tink tinkering and you know we understand that manufacturing tolerances are a fact of life you can't get around them Absolutely. and when you when you take an instrument and you cut it in half make it half as long twice as small you're 
you're usually not using or switching to a manufacturing process that's twice as accurate. So to me, the question is when you get to at a certain point, you're going to get small enough that routine manufacturing defects are going to be, you know, make differences of like 15 cents or something like that. And just the size and placement of tone holes. So I do think it's a real question how accurately you could building, you know, something using traditional manufacturing uh, out of traditional materials, how well in tune a uh, piccolo or a, a super high instrument could be just based off of those limitations. But at the same rate, well, we he... do have piccolo flutes that have that uh, those tolerances. Some, 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 some would argue, even piccolo players among them, that that's a demonstration of that. Um, you know, because they, they are. They're incredibly difficult to tune, and people go to a lot of trouble to fine-tune them um, just because of how critical... I mean, just like sub millimeter uh adjustments and how not not even just how big the tone holes are but how much the how high the pads sit over those tone holes can make enormous differences on the intonation yeah. and of course anything that's that's that finicky is going to be subject to going out of adjustment fairly easily C case in point i had a friend who bought an a flat clarinet and he couldn't use it he bought it brand new from Ripamonte. And so it should have been in great working condition. But when he got it, the twelfths between the registers were elevenths. Mm. And so the the Clarino range, perfectly in tune, or as close to in tune as possible. The Shalomo was a half step sharp. So he could play the Shalomo range and think of it like a piccolo clarinet and a, but the upper one was in A flat. And nobody could fix it. He s sent it around to pretty much every uh, repair technician said, there's there's no way to fix this. It's just... The it should have to me. <laughs> I don't even know if you could have done it. Because, I mean, is there a way to fix that? I mean... Yeah, actually, so this actually... Uh, so I recently, um, somebody reached out to me on eBay. They were talking about their uh, Selmer Bassett horn and how um, the upper register was like 30 cents sharp. Um, so I said, yeah, I'll take a look at it. And the reason it was so sharp is because when somebody was trying to fix a crack, um, they actually went inside the bore and they started filing out the excess glue. And what they did was they enlarged the bore to the point where the upper register was uh, higher than it should be. So the way you fix that actually is you just vary the size of the barrel, or in the case of the piccolo clarinet, you, you'd have to vary the size of the bore there. So you could add like a material like epoxy at certain points in the bore, and you can actually tune the upper register. So I actually did this to my bass clarinet. So I had a, an old Selmer bass clarinet where the upper register was, again, 20 cents sharp. So what I did was I took little pieces of cork that I, uh, that I soaked in epoxy, and I actually glued them to the inside of the bore in certain locations, and that actually fixed the, uh, the spread between the 12s. So yeah, it is, it is possible to fine tune those things. I think a lot of people just don't realize um, well, for one, how to do it, and two, that it's even possible. Um, and because a lot of people, they're not going to. And, and not that. everyone would want to be responsible for for that because yeah, if something that's wrong, it can go very wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think when people hear that, like, oh, I'm gluing stuff inside the board of my clarinet, they're going to say, oh, I don't want even to touch that. I mean, yeah, no, a lot of prepare. Let's let's face it, a lot of woodwind players are fall victim to like woodwind woo. You know, it's yeah, just these exactly. these magic tubes that make music, and we can't talk talk about them scientifically because it's it's only for art. La freak. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think um one one place where I have an advantage is that I don't feel afraid to experiment with instruments. I mean, like I've taken like junk clarinets and I've modified things just to figure out what will happen. And I think a lot of people just don't want to do that because they're scared of uh, breaking instruments. But, but I think once you get past that fear and you start to experiment with things, you start to realize that a lot of what we considered um, problems with the instrument that were impossible to fix really are just things that can be adjusted fairly easily with something that might not seem like it would work, but until you try it, you never know. Yeah. yeah. So, someone made a weird design choice 100 years ago, and it's just been kind of 
thoughtlessly copied for a hundred years without anyone really thinking about it. It's kind of like, <sighs> Brett, you, you know the the Mollenhauer contrabassoons, how they have those completely useless rollers on the octave keys? Um, Do you know I, what I'm talking I, 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 I know what you're talking about. I've never played a Mollenhauer. Yeah. Like, who came up with that? But yet they still have them. Yeah. Uh, okay, Here, here's a great question. Uh, Jared and Richard, how did you learn the ins and outs of tone hole sizing slash placement and other aspects of wood, wind instrument design? That's a good question. So, um, so whenever I'm building a new instrument, I always buy enough material to make uh, two bodies because usually I'm using PVC pipe. So what I'll do is um, if I don't have an instrument to copy, I'll, I'll just pretty much just start drilling holes in the piece of PVC pipe that I have as a spare so I can figure out where the um, the tonal locations are. And I know that this method's kind of crude, but I mean, trial and error is probably one of the, the best methods that's been- Well, for woodwinds, yes. I mean, yeah. it is it is the historical way that woodwinds were made. Uh, I mean, and it's still the way that they're made. Uh, yeah, I in my case, I had to resort to some less pretty, uh, tools because you know when you're i do think there's a lot of benefits about having a conical instrument in the 32 foot register because you don't have those uh heavily suppressed second and fourth harmonics the massive massive drawback is that you can't use cylindrical tubing you have to find you have to manufacture conical tubing um so trial and error is let me let me let me be clear if trial and error were possible 100 percent, i think that that would be the better uh better solution because the the science and math of woodwinds is still i mean like uh I, i'm sure you know i think you both know of the you know the acoustical aspects of woodwind instruments at the neverdean book um you know it's it's thick, it's complicated, there's, you know, math in it that mu music majors will have never seen before, and even it will say things like, well, and then there's this thing that we don't really understand, and it made a difference of about 40 cents. Okay, um, but in my, in my situation, I had to, I have to, I have to start from somewhere, uh, and when something has, you know, like, uh, 15 body joints uh everything has to fit together so i had to go what i would consider the less elegant route which is the the math route um so that's the more I, elegant route yeah no that's the more elegant no i i i i disagree i disagree um because <laughs> you had to do the math and not us well but I, I think I think that the deeper you, deeper you get into the math, the, the more it becomes clear that there's a lot about woodwinds that we don't fully understand. Hold on a second. You getting the book? Yeah, this is the book I'm talking about, uh, the um, C.J. Neverdean Acoustical Aspects of Woodwind Instruments. It's a very interesting book. Uh, it has a lot of good information in it. But there, there's very real limitations to what we know. I mean, woodwinds are very complicated uh, acoustical systems. Uh, every tone hole affects every other tone hole. And I absolutely fully expect that the first subconscious prototype is going to be out of tune. There's going to be notes on it that are very difficult to bring into tune just with embouchure and reed. Uh, but you have to, you have to start somewhere. And in my case, I had to start with some crazy math, but if I had the option to start, to start, start with, you know, go to home Depot and buy my, uh, uh, 40 feet of, uh, plastic tubing that was already pre-manufactured to have a, um, 1.00875 taper in it, I would absolutely be have done that. 
I'm going to need to get some numbers from you when I start designing. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to actually start designing the the Great Base Bassoon. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, Manny actually had a, a very interesting question, and I don't, I, I'll be honest, off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to it, and that is a reed instrument with a reverse conical bore. My understanding is that it would function like any conical, any other conical bore. But I, I do think you'd, you'd end up with a limiting factor where you'd have to start with like a clarinet size mouthpiece, right? So that the bore starts large enough. And then you'd have to, because if the taper is too shallow, it will, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a binary thing where it's either a perfect cylinder or it functions like a, a conical Re, uh, instrument there's kind of this nebulous you can build i mean like clarinets for example are often not pure cylinders uh they they often have you know uh more subtle shapes in yeah. mind and particularly um, like in the barrel and then the, there's mm -hmm. a flare in the and before you get to the bell which changes a lot of intonation stuff well, yeah. um, uh, sorry. Uh, so one person in the chat was a uh, helicopter harmonics. He's kind of worked on the the idea of an inverse conical oh, instrument, okay. and, I, and I was kind of curious about this too. So I took a mouthpiece and I put it on my alto recorder, and like he said, I was actually really surprised. So it actually overblowed at uh, two octaves, which I, I was not expecting at all. I don't know how that works. I I, I, I don't know the math behind that, but somehow it works. Um, so yeah, there is potential for an instrument like that. The one problem I found though was projection. It was yeah. as, as much as the clarinet is a, it has really bad projection. That that instrument I could barely make anything above like a, a mezzo piano. But yeah, yeah, it's a there's, there's potential. There's a reason the only uh, the only modern woodwind that's kind of designed with a reverse conical uh, bore profile is the piccolo. The one instrument we usually want to be a little bit softer. Yeah, and you know I've got uh, both a, a cylindrical piccolo and a, a conical piccolo, and there is a distinct timbral difference between the two. But it, I mean, it's not enough to change the fundamental harmonics of the instrument. Yeah. Well, now I, now I feel like I need to three D print something and see what what I can do, or what exactly what I mean. I'm not. I'm not uh, doubting anybody, but you know, there's 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 hearing it, and then there's seeing it for yourself in action. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even if you just take like a, I think I used a clarinet or an alto clarinet mouthpiece taped to an alto recorder. Um, and I mean, of course, the notes were in tune, but I was able to kind of get like a like sort of a proof of concept. And I, I was even considering making a full on uh, burn system instrument like this, but I think a uh, helicopter yeah, helicopter is the one who wants to do that. So, that. so I'm going to oh, kind of let him move his well, project. Sorry, that was a bad idea. <laughs> Did you unplug your, your uh, headset, Richard? Yeah, hold on a second. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so, yeah, with, um, <laughs> with, clarinet, so back to what I, we were talking about earlier with clarinets, uh, you know, you've got the upper range extension, and then of course there, there's Jared's lower range extensions, which we know work because we've got the, the two existing instruments, and then there's your uh, prototypes that are working on. Um, I, I I honestly okay. think sorry that about that. There there could be and will be a uh, a uh, a function for these. I I would think. I don't, I don't know. It it would be interesting to see if there's a, a need for both the E flat and the B flat giant uh, contra clarinets, uh, but that that's to be seen once the instruments are built. I think. Well, I think there's already a, like a precedent with the clarinet family that there are instruments already in E flat and B flat, and that's kind of the standard family. So I think right. it's you kind of can't really have one without the other. Even if one doesn't really get used a lot, it's still gonna exist to some extent. Uh, uh, yeah, you've got, you've got that. Though, I mean, if we're looking at it from a, a harmonic series point of view, as, as you go... Sorry. 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as I was saying, as you go lower, the instruments probably should be spaced further apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I say that as somebody who wants a great bass bassoon. So, but then, then again, you're you're still work, working in there a range that could easily be be workable. But the yeah, internet family is already so large that. I mean, the only other things you could really do are, you know, extended range to low C on most, if not all, the members of the family. Uh, and it would be nice to have uh, those as kind of like removable extensions. Like, I know on my alto and my bass clarinets, it would be, it would not be difficult to create a removable extension. <laughs> So you guys have your PVC instruments. This was my PVC experiment that um, I've I've got the, I've got the math on it. This is uh, when I get a 3D printer. It's going to be the first thing that I um, I build. Uh, but yeah. I mean, it won't. I don't think it'll be difficult. I've got all the the measurements from Steve Fox on how to do it. So, but. Uh, I mean, that would be, you know, something. But uh, I think our, our really within the Woodwind family, our biggest gaps are within the Double Reed family because the players have never really pushed it. Composers have never really pushed it. And, you know, flutes have just expanded to, like, the stupid number of instruments. I mean, to the point, you know, we've got uh, contra alto or, or baritone flutes in both G and F. Like okay, why? Why can't we? Yeah, just... but those those aren't really distinct instruments as much as they are just different manufacturing man, manufacturers have different ideas about what key those instruments should be in. Right, but you know, from my point of view as a composer, it's like, well, okay, which one am I writing for? Am I going to write for G? Am I going to write for F? Should I just have both parts available? Uh, and so having the instruments in those two separate keys, especially for a rare instrument like that, I, I think probably hurts the, um, the, the potential. Well, I think what's going to happen is that um, the, like uh, those musicians who are more interested in these rare members of the flute family, they're probably going to go with what's cheaper and what's more available. And in this case, it's probably going to be the Hogan Huys flutes. Oh, yeah, which, absolutely. Which, of course, they're... Yeah, so those are in G, so that's probably going to dominate. I mean, instruments in F may exist, but it's kind of like the bass clarinet in C. It, it existed, but it, it's no longer there because we have the bass clarinet in B flat, which turned out to be the more uh, used instrument. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, that's... I... Oh, go ahead, Richard. No, no, no. I was just going to say that I, I, I kind of, I kind of feel similarly on the, the, I think. Well, like you were saying, the instruments has to have to kind of follow the function, and as you get down lower, there's less need, you know. Like even going back to the the E flat and the, you know, the E flat contra. I know you, we can get into a whole mess of nomenclature here. The the e, the two instruments immediately below the bass clarinet. Um, I would argue that usually. One of them either plays in unison with the bass clarinet or the octave below. Um, so between those three instruments, you usually only have two parts. Um, You're not wrong. I mean, that is very yeah, typically how true. it's done. And um, I mean, I know a there are very, very few pieces that call for both the E flat uh, and the B flat contras. Well, I, I think that they're out there, but they're used as like, well, whichever one you have, give this part to them. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I'm talking about pieces that are specific that yeah. they re need both parts. Uh, a great uh, example of this is uh, Michael Colgrass's The Winds of Narwhal. And he's got specific parts for the B-flight contra and the E-flight contra, and they, they have different functions. We also see this a lot in Hollywood scoring that composers will be using the E flat contra differently than they're using the B flat contra. Uh, 
So the B flat contra is just there for the the massive pedal notes, whereas the E flat contra they're using a lot more for flexible stuff. And you will occasionally see both getting used together. Uh, I remember the first time I ever saw it uh, was uh, Danny Elfman scored a Sleepy Hollow. I mean, they had a section of like two basses, a contra alto, and a contra bass. Yeah, I think those like the the um the E flat and the B flat can definitely have different uses where the I mean the B flat is pretty much a uh, it's a, it's a harmony instrument. It's very hard to play any kind of melody on it, but the E flat definitely has some uh, melodic potential. That but it's, but it's, is that a limitation of the the concept of that instrument or is that a limitation of the uh, implementation of the instrument? It kind and, of other gets- yeah, sorry, it kind of just gets to the point where um, if you want to play something that's, uh, I mean, obviously a contra bass clinic can play bass lines, but if you're trying to play like a, a melody, um, you're really, in order to play something that's really like a, in, a, in, a, in a good register, you really have to be playing at the upper edge of the instrument where most instruments are just not optimized. So yeah, maybe if you had a contra bass that was optimized for the upper register, definitely it could be possible, but it just most aren't. Whereas uh, contra altos, uh, especially the Selmers and the Bundys, which are the most common, they are fairly well optimized for the upper register, so they do serve that purpose a lot better. Yeah, uh, when Joe Clark premiered my uh, three songs for contra alto a couple years ago, you know, I took that instrument all the way up to F above the staff, and he made it sing up there. Had I done the same thing on a B flat contra bass, uh, I don't think he could have done that. Uh, there are a few players out there who could in that register. Um, like Jason Alder could, uh, Sarah Watts could, uh, but I don't think many other players can. So it it actually is possible to play an E and an F on contra bass because there's like a you can use the the G sharp key as a uh, kind of as a vent. But yeah, anything above F is pretty much just uh, impossible. And even F is kind of, you have to have a really developed aperture to play it properly. Yeah. Of, of course, then you go talk to Jason and say, oh yeah, no, I can play five and a half octaves on this thing. No problem. Oh yeah. He's crazy. Well, yeah. <laughs> he, he, he uses that Terrace Lerstad fingering chart that was floating around the internet like a decade ago. Oh uh, no, he's developed his own. That's part of, oh, his, okay. that, that's part of his dissertation. And he's he's developed one for the uh, the Selmer and one for the LeBlanc. Mm. So the, he has both. Uh, actually, I think he's got an Orsi now too. So he he may be just borrowing. Yeah, I saw that on Orsi. Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but anyway, so um, uh, yeah. So let let's talk uh. Richard and I talked about this quite a lot uh, about you know expanding the the double reed family last week, um, you know filling in some of the bassoon spots. You know, you want a, a bassoon in the key of D, one step higher, or uh, more correctly, probably in the key of G. <laughs> I I, I want I want something to play Marriage of Figaro on. <laughs> that that that's mainly it. I, but I wouldn't even be thinking of it as a different instrument. I would be thinking of it as just a way to cheat. It's kind of like a clarinet uses a B flat and an A clarinet. A bassoon player could have a yeah. C and a D yeah. bassoon. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not opposed like, to that idea. It would ju- it would be a a large expense for a little bit of technical freedom. Yeah, but think about how much of one's career is dependent on Marriage of Figaro. Getting the job certainly is. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but of course, getting the job would probably be the one situation where you would not be able to use it. So. Right. And there, therein is, is interesting. Though I have, have you, I'm sure you've played Marriage of Figaro before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've played it several times. I um, I don't. The the actually the hardest part are the the repeated eighth notes. I that's yeah. for me the hardest part. So in in performance, it's really not that bad because you don't have to be that stupid soft. No. Um, it, it it's just another one of those audition excerpts that they throw at you because they want to torture you. Uh, you know. Uh, luckily. Uh, 
yeah. Uh, marriage, marriage of Figaro. Not it. It's not that bad on performance, but on auditions, it's it's a nightmare. Yeah, it, it it's. It's not something you you want to play all that often. Though I will say I find it a lot easier with the the pinky whisper key. Hmm. Um. That that really helps because it just completely frees up your thumb, and then you can release it when you need to get up to the A's. Hmm. But I guess Jared left us. Bye, Jared. Uh, I'm, I'm oh, sure he'll be back. Part. Okay, um, but you know, you know, bas- that it's it's interesting that uh, bassoons and oboes have really never had that kind of uh, you know auxiliary principal instrument, kind of like clarinets have or trumpets have. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you know, an oboe in the key of B flat, half a step or a whole step lower, would be interesting, and I think that could serve a function like uh, a bassoon in the key of D, a step higher. Yeah, but the thing is, I can't. Um, it has nothing to do with logic. It just has to do with psychology. I cannot imagine an oboist touch or uh, ever wanting an instrument in the key of B flat. I think they'd pick one in B natural first, just to be contrarian. You're not wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, oh, here's the here's the big fight. Manny just. Uh, <laughs> Posted the big fight. <laughs> uh, uh, what are your thoughts of F versus G instruments? Okay, for tenor. Room. <laughs> okay, um, Richard. It, well, I don't think it's as big a fight as 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 you think. Uh, you're winning me over with your argument. You know, for the longest time, I was more a proponent of the F instrument. Uh, more and more, I'm seeing the advantages of the G. Um. So um, at, I, um, I ran a poll on, uh, last week on the Contra Bassoonists United Facebook group. I said, if someone were to develop an, uh, an instrument between the bassoon and the Contra Bassoon, would you want it pitched in F, a fifth lower, or in G, a fourth lower? And for a, for a good long while, um, the, the G instrument was the clear winner. Now I looked at it before we started the stream and actually the F instrument's the winner. But it's... It, yeah, we got we got review bombed. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's uh, it's not a a overwhelming majority, though. It's yeah. it's like 55, 45%, something like that. Yeah, um, so, so my, my argument is that the, the regular bassoon is not is not in c that the regular bassoon is an f instrument that's notated in concert pitch um now with that in mind it's not a matter of should the tenor or the great bass be an instrument be in g or f it should it be in c or b flat is is the basic scale of the instrument the the you know from the open note down to the seven finger note is that a c or B flat, and for me the easy choice is C. Uh, I, I, coming from the position of any other woodwind, you know, your seven finger note would be written a C or an F. Pretty much any instrument, and I personally wouldn't want to in- involve uh, transposition uh, into the bassoon world. Um, I think uh, it would be better to have an instrument that didn't need transposition. And the advantage of an instrument in G is that you could read tenor clef just like bass clef. So open F, uh, or if you take off all your fingers, that would be C, written in tenor clef, which is on the fourth line from the bottom. Um, And so you could... I, I think it'd be more useful overall, but... I would if anyone wants to send me a tenor rune, I am not picky. I will gladly accept either version. You know, it's funny. The th- of the three of us, one of us owns a tenor rune, and it's <laughs> neither of the two bassoon players. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I wanted to try and learn bassoon, but I'm starting to realize I hate it. So it's kind of just sitting in a corner doing nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, well, if I'll it makes you feel any better, I feel the same way about clarinet. Uh, I'll stick with my logical fingerings. <laughs> 
<laughs> Your twelfths are logical. Mm. <laughs> hey, come on. The the altissimo or the you know the the register above uh, high C on clarinet is just beautiful. Just oh. you know fifth harmonics. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. 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 No, I I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. Bassoon fingerings are. That's so cuckoo. I... And see, as, as someone who plays contrabassoon professionally, including needing to play on four different instruments in different situations, bassoon fingerings are just so so nice and straightforward compared to that. Like, I, I'll be honest, I don't do much innovating on bassoon. So it's like, well, these are the fingerings my teacher taught me, and they still work. So yeah. awesome. We'll, we'll leave the, the bassoon fingering innovation to Christian. Yeah. <laughs> well, even he's, he's kind of sticking with the traditional bassoon, just with, you know, a lot of extra gizmos. Yeah. You know, he's not talking about a wild overhaul of the entire instrument. Yeah. I, I, that would be, you know... So I, I did some drafting the other night while uh, trying to go to sleep in bed, and I just brought a pad and paper with me, and I started... I figured out basically how to make a, a, an automatic octave system for bassoon. The, the problem is, I think you can implement it on a great bass. I don't think you can implement it on a regular bassoon, because you would actually need a longer wing joint and a shorter vocal in order to mm -hmm. get... Yeah. And, and I, th now I finally understand what you were talking about um, last week. You've got to have a full F vent. There is no good... Uh, you'd need a full vent where the whisper key is. And that it just doesn't mm -hmm. function well. But I figured out conceptually how to make a, a quadruple octave system, automatic octave system work with one key. Yeah, but even then, any automatic octave system limits you. Uh, anything, anything that's coupled is something that can't be used, is a vent that can't be used in certain situations. So, um, so like... I, I'm kind of, I know this isn't a popular opinion anymore, but I'm kind of on the side of, you know, the bassoon's okay. You know, venting's not, uh, venting or flicking isn't that complex compared to what the brass players have to do with their embouchure, you know. I actually I, found, I, I found a, a solution to that problem, though. You have one key to do uh, the automatic stuff, and then next to those keys you have... Uh, selector vents basically doubling what the a c and d keys do yeah so that and then once again you... both i've actually seen a bass carnets like that where the um where it has like the, the the vent and then the the throat b flat mechanism but there's also an extra key where you can just open the throat b flat for certain uh, multiphonics and stuff mm-hmm uh... Were those custom instruments, or were they standard? Yeah, they were. So, there were a few custom LeBlanc bass clarinets. Uh, I forget who played them, but yeah, there were there were a few of those. I think. All right. So um, Archibald was asking about alto. So alto bassoon. Yes, they do exist. Uh, check out Guntram Volz. But, but not really. <laughs> they exist as, <laughs> as a kitty uh, beginner instrument. Um, he calls uh, Wolf calls them the octave bassoon. They're pitched one octave higher. Um, there have been a few uh, quasi professional models made, um, but it's it's got a long way to go. Um, you know, for a while, for many years, that what the instruments that were being made were not fully chromatic. So you couldn't yeah. play a low B natural or a low C sharp. I well, think... the, you you can still buy those instruments. Yes, like they're they're still for sale. I know because I recently uh, paid off uh, a decent amount of uh, debt, so I found myself looking at them on Wolf's website. Um, and yeah, you can still buy those. Oh yeah, the, yeah. The ones that are not fully chromatic. And. 
you would probably need to get one of the fully chromatic ones custom built. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my guess is Wolf has not updated their website in several years. But um, I think Midwest got one in at one point that was fully chromatic. Uh, but even, even then, I've played them before. Um, it you, they would not play above written F above the staff, so they only had a two and a half octave range. It, yeah. it would well, not it, extend the bassoon range any higher than it already goes. Well, and before any of these instruments would be able to catch on, they they have to abandon the concept of being able to use a bassoon read on it. Okay. I mean, it's just it's not it's not a uh, it, if your goal is to give a kid a way to play the bassoon from an earlier age to get used to a bassoon read and get used to the basic scale of the instrument, it's great. Uh, but they really need redesigned vocals and specially designed reads for professional work. If they're going to become, if there's any chance of them becoming serious instruments, you know, that a bassoonist might pick up a uh, to play a, a solo. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it'd be, it's like uh, B flat clarinet to E flat clarinet. Oh, and that's actually not a good example because a lot of E flat clarinet players are now using B flat clarinet reeds. So, uh, bad example there. Maybe the difference between yeah, but, an oboe reed and an English horn reed. Yeah, but, you know, uh, I don't know. This, this might just be. Uh, the ignorance of a double read player here, but I, I, I don't think it should be too con uh, controversial to say that uh, double reads are much more uh, read sensitive uh, than yeah. single. Oh yeah. Well, the thing with double reads is that um, well, with single reads, you basically have the what can determines how the like the uh, all the intonation characteristics of your instrument is the shape of the uh, the, the chamber of the mouthpiece, mm -hmm. but with double reads. That, that chamber is essentially the, 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 the space between the two reeds, so there's so much variability there. Yeah. Yeah, which is why you know, double reeds are, are so much finickier. Uh, look at the price difference between a Leger bassoon reed and a Leger clarinet reed. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, 150 bucks versus 25 Maybe they're up to thirty now for the the clarinet reads, but but uh, so I'll ask this from a, uh, a composer point of view: Are the smaller bassoons um, potentially viable uh, to for composers? At the present time, no. But I I what? Let me, let me back up. At the present time, I think if you wrote a part for a, a tenoroon, you would be presenting a pretty substantial obstacle to having to, to performing your piece. I do think the concept of the instrument, I mean, there's no reason why a bassoon, a fourth or a fifth higher should be any crazier than the idea of an English horn, a fourth lower. Um, it's just the implementation is not there at a profession for, for professional, for professional playing yet. Right. And uh, this is a chicken and egg thing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you are not going to get those instruments until you get music that needs them, but you're not going to get music that needs them until you get the instruments. So... Who needs to make the first step? Do the composers need to make the first step to actually write serious music for it? Or do manufacturers need to make the first step? I think historically it's typically been the composers that make the first step. My, my vote is for crazy people um, who are not necessarily either making the first step. Yeah, I think it could, it could be either or. Um, if somebody comes up with a piece that's that really needs an Altoon that um, 
then there there is a potential for somebody to make an instrument. But again, if an instrument manufacturer actually makes a decent instrument, some more adventurous musicians are probably going to purchase it if they have the financial means. And then once enough musicians have it, they're going to want some pieces written for it. So then we could potentially see a rise in the instruments. But somebody needs to take the first step. Essentially, you know what we we know what we need. We need more rich double reed players because I like I'm I'm Facebook friends with some of these saxophone players and. I don't know how much money they must have because they just they have Sax everything are relatively ev- cheap. Not inherently. I mean, there there's still a lot of uh, manual labor involved. There's a lot of design. I mean, you can't just take a you can't make a saxophone by throwing a big block of brass up on a lathe and going to town. The way that you can, you know, um, a uh, a recorder or e- like a simple oboe or something. Uh, I, I just I feel like there's a lot more money out there for. How many more saxophone players are there than double reed players? This is the question. Yeah, I think there's just yeah. It's, I mean. So, I mean, this gets to the point, wh- who would manufacture these instruments? And I, I don't think any of your your instrument manufacturers would do it. I think it would be people like us who are curious and crazy enough uh, to do it. People who don't care about the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Pe- pe- I mean, pe- people who are comfortable taking an idea investing in it just to see if it'll happen and then hoping that it becomes successful enough that the major manufacturers steal it. And, and, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating at all. That's what I want to happen. Like, I don't like if my, if the sub contrabassoon becomes wildly successful, I don't want to, you know, be manufacturing the world supply of sub contrabassoons for the rest of my life. I, I want, you know, Fox or Bell or someone to to come along and say, hey, that's actually selling. I'm going to make some of those. Yeah, that's, why I did, that's why I didn't call it a boba phone or, you know, something weird like that. That is, straight, that, straight is honestly, the name boba phone, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it goes right up there with, with sack button, you know, doodle sack. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, this is something I, I, I talked to you about, uh, I guess, a few days ago. What if, I mean, just like we get all of our instrument nut friends together and form a company to, to actually build the instruments. I mean, I, I don't think we could, could right now. I, I mean, and everybody's scattered across the country, but I, there are enough like-minded players like us and composers and t- instrument techs that it is theoretically possible. Yeah, but you know, it's hard to it's hard for people to feel ownership of a company like that unless they're geographically close and can play an active role. Right. Um and yeah, we're just, you know, spread all over the place. I mean, you and I are actually relatively close together and we're still five hours apart. Right. Uh and I mean one of these days I've I just need to get up there and, and visit you. I you know, my travel has been pretty limited uh last couple of years, but Maybe maybe we'll do that at some point. Um, mm. But it would be it would be interesting to to see something like that happen because let, let's face it the the main manufacturers are not going to do it because they're in it to make money they're not in it to really innovate. Which is, well, and and yeah, which is something that is a and you know bit to be different. honest the double read players. Sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was going to say it, it's interesting. Brass players don't have that same problem because uh, you can build a brass instrument in your garage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you you get a valve cluster and some pipe, and you're good to go. Right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And, and you know how to solder. And yeah, mm-hmm. uh, woodwinds are so much more difficult, though. But 
I, I think there there could be a demand for it. Uh, I don't know. I just it's one of those things at the back of my mind always. Like, man, I just why can't we just be building these instruments that we want to have? Yeah, I mean, I think each of us, like, individually, we kind of have started towards that goal where, like, uh, Richard's, of course, building the subcontract pursuit, and I'm pretty much building whatever I can scrounge together with PVC pipe and old clarinet keys. What would be really cool is if we, like, did, like, a like a group collaboration project where, like, one of us worked on the keys, and then one of us worked on the body, and then someone did the tuning. I mean, that's the only hypothetical way I could see something like that working. With, yeah, with, with us being so spread apart, um, uh, you know, it, it's not it's not impossible to do. I mean, we could we could probably all, all go in on designing of something like uh, the Great Bass Bassoon or uh, extra large oboes, which would be uh, also something that could be done. As Richard looks wistfully at his recorder. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I was listening. I was listening. <laughs> no, I, yeah, no, I, but, you know, it's, it's uh, fascinating. I mean, I, ideas. I, I don't know of a good answer for that because, I mean, you know, like we, we've seen in the past several decades, you know, uh, almost a retraction of woodwind, uh, of new woodwind designs with the exception of flutes. Uh, and maybe maybe saxophones, but like the say, wooden the I, wooden bodied instruments, I would like say that Mook that's... no longer manufactures uh, the 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 old Renaissance uh, woodwinds at all. Uh, is anyone making paperclip contras anymore, other than Eppelshine? Uh, uh, so uh, Re- Reba Monte is making them, but they're they're Chinese. Hmm. But I mean, I think it, a lot of that's because um, there's just a, a lot of these more exotic instruments they they kind of fill a, a small niche and uh there's just not enough room for more than one uh more than a few manufacturers to make instruments like that but that being said that doesn't mean there hasn't been a uh, innovation i mean obviously most of the innovation goes to instruments that are more likely to sell like for example uh selmer's new privilege bass clarinet has a lot of advancements over other bass clarinets because they knew it would sell but like more niche instruments they're less likely to get uh, developments, but that doesn't mean we can't steal stuff that's been developed for the bass clarinet and put it on, let's say, an octocontra bass clarinet. Let's say they come up with a good idea for making a, a mechanism. Well, I could just uh, take that and kind of copy it, and there you go. I got some. It's it's now a more advanced version of whatever I was trying to make. I mean, so that that's kind of how the innovation is ha- is happening. It's I mean, well, if you if you look at it, actually, we're we're kind of to a point where, yeah, there's there's not a lot of innovation happening. That's because there's just been so much innovation over the last 200 years. I mean, we've gone from like five key clarinets and eight off sax made his improvements. And then we just keep going and going until we get to a modern instrument, which is very, very capable. Um, do we really need any more improvements on that? I mean, obviously we can keep improving it, but it's to the point where it's good enough for 99% of players. So like, why should we improve it? Uh, uh, yeah. So back to, to what Richard said, he said it's the last few decades. I think it's a lot longer than that. I don't think, I think uh, the recent flute expansion aside, uh, throughout the, the entirety of the 20th century, the only real innovation you have is in the contra clarinets. You don't see anything else really getting innovated on. Uh, you get low A's in the berry sax. You get low C's in the bass clarinets. But that's even a holdover all the way back to like 1770 with the very first bass clarinet. Um, so there's not a lot of woodwind innovation that's gone on in the past hundred years. But I think what you're seeing now is a move away from the large... Uh, factories buffet selmer uh, and what you're seeing are a lot more artisans uh small companies do doing more innovation i mean you look at someone like steve but those are but those are also mm -hmm. uh yeah but i mean those are also the people the, the smaller firms are also the the people that could 
while they might be the more successful at some of this stuff, it's also probably the, um, I don't know, wouldn't it be a bigger financial burden for them? I mean, like, you know, if Yamaha wanted to make an octo contra alto clarinet, you know, they could they could do it. No problem. You know, and if it failed, oh, well, you know, they just take a small write off. Um, but for a small firm, I mean, like, um, like you know, you, you mentioned Steve Fox, uh, you know, for a long time, he's been trying to build uh, the Contra um, Bolin Pierce clarinet. Right. And yeah. I, I think he's he's still still in the process of, of getting that going just because oh, I, I thought he had finished that last year. Okay, I mean, if it just happened last year, then uh, I would. Then that that's entirely possible. Yeah, I think he he used uh, Bundy clarinet, uh, Bundy uh, contra clarinet parts, mm. and I think probably made a whole new body, but everything else was off of a Bundy. Uh, the Uh, I think his biggest problem with that is he just didn't have a lathe big enough. Uh, but mm. where the 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 advantage to something like that is with making each part by hand and not doing it in, in a factory setting, you can um, change out parts much easier than you can in a big factory, where everything gets mass produced at once. Well, I think yeah. this brings up a sorry. I think this brings up a good point about um, like a handmade instrument. So there's really a lot of people would assume that you would have to make every single part from scratch. Where um, thanks to a lot of uh, like modern manufacturing innovations, that's not really necessary. Like for example, let's say I wanted to make a, a Bolin Pierce uh, contra clarinet, I, I could uh, try and find a lathe that's big enough to make the body. Or I could go on, like, let's say, make Master Car and buy a piece of Delrin tubing that has a one and a half inch outer diameter by one inch inner diameter. And maybe it's not exactly the dimensions I want, but it's close enough. I mean, a lot of what I like to do is I like to see which parts I can get the easiest and which I can use. Maybe not the best for my needs, but something that's easier to do than trying to build everything from scratch. So that that actually is a possibility. You can actually order uh, Delrin tube like that with the inner bore already done. Yeah, um, I was actually. But, but it's uh, you're pretty limited on what sizes you can get it in. Like yeah. I, like the big reason I couldn't use it for the the conical uh, things, it, uh, the conical segments of the subcontrasting joint, because that would have saved a lot of time having that bore or having a bore already in there that I could then finish out to a cone is you just couldn't get the right um, sizes. So like, uh, you know, he said, you know, with an inch and a half outer diameter and an inch and a quarter inner diameter, well, what if you need an inch and three eighths inner diameter and an inch and five eighths outer, outer diameter? Then neither of the two sizes that you can get are going to, to work. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously not a like a cure-all solution for everything. Although, like, uh, like to taking your example, what you could do is buy like oversized tubing and then machine it down. I mean, yes, there's some machine work, but it's theoretically simple than boring, simpler yeah. than boring something out. Yeah, but it, I guess, well, the problem I ran into is I would need because of the length of the joints, I would need something with like a half inch wall. Um, in, in order to, to, to machine that cone from one end to the other. But it's, um, I, trust me, I, I did look uh, for, for that sort, for tubing that would have worked for what I needed. And it just, uh, short of having something custom manufactured, um, I, I didn't find something that would have worked for, for what I needed. But that's, that's, once again, when you're dealing with conical instruments, it's it's a whole different ball game as far as oh yeah paint. Well, um, going along those lines, um, even though you weren't able to find something that fit your needs, you were able to find that you could 3D print the joints. And I guess the point I'm trying to make is that with like uh, these modern manufacturing processes that are now more accessible, not just to factories but to people like you and me who may not have a uh, 
a manufacturing background, um, we, we, have, we have the access to uh, processes that we could use to build these more exotic instruments ourselves. And I'm hoping that's something we're going to see in the, in the coming decades, more uh, musicians who might be uh, tinkerers are trying to, trying to build their own instruments. I'm hoping that's something that's going to become more common and we might start to see some more innovation again. Yeah, and, and like what I've found in just conversations with a lot of a lot of these uh, 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 people of a similar mindset is one of the limitations is the the CAD software. There's just not. It's very very far outside the traditional musician skill set, and. Hmm. Um, and honestly, the, the options aren't that great either. Like, I'm incredibly lucky. Uh, I, my dad has a shop, and he has Aut uh, Autodesk Inventor installed on his computers. And that is a very expensive program that I can use. I don't have to pay for, I don't have to pay for it. Um, and unless you're connected to a university, that's probably not something that you're going to have available. So, uh, you know... If, if I were having to use something like Blender to design this kind of stuff in, that would have been an absolute nightmare. Is Blender the free version? Yeah, it, it's, not, it's not even CAD software. Blender is like a, a mesh modeling software. Okay. So it's... Well, I think um, they also have now the 1-2-3-D uh, the design. That's the, uh, like the free version of the... Uh, yeah, I... So I've I've tried so many free CAD programs, and part of part of it is I I'm I, I use Mac, and oh yeah, <laughs> if you want if you want to talk about worlds colliding, the CAD world and the Mac world do not collide at all. Uh, I think I I think I use that analogy incorrectly, or that yeah. Anyway, they don't overlap uh, at all. They don't overlap at all. Like the the free CAD, uh, the the free Mac CAD programs are just garbage, or at least everyone I've tried is. Yeah, I, I mean, I I took a a CAD drafting class back in high school, but that's been twenty years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, I get it was an early version of AutoCAD back then, and you know, yeah, I, I got you know fairly proficient at it, but I don't remember any of it from twenty years ago. Yeah, and and like, my dad still still swears by auto AutoCAD, and I can't stand it. <laughs> uh, like uh, the really the first CAD program I ever started using seriously was Inventor. So my I when I think about these sort of projects, I think about it from the point of view where how you or how you would do it in Inventor, whereas he thinks about it in terms of. Uh, AutoCAD, you know, this like kind of this two. Was this like a Sibelius versus Finale debate? No, it's more fundamental than that. Uh, AutoCAD is more like like drafting, but with the aid of a computer. Um, Inventor is more a modeling approach. Okay. It's, it's further removed from kind of like the old. You mentioned that you had a, a drafting class in high school or high school I, I was in one too and when i was in high school it, it's weird because i think we're uh, you know roughly the same age we, we were actually you know like paper paper and straight edges and that kind of stuff so we might have just had an old school drafting program yeah. and no, i was I, still doing like i'm oh, sorry so i was again? still doing that like five years ago yeah so they're still teaching that but yeah i'm i'm what I mostly use is uh, when I do use 3D modeling is SolidWorks, just because it's so it's so intuitive. Like once you kind of learn these few concepts, it's, you can kind of figure out your way from there. And I think like a lot of the innovation we're going to see is not from musicians necessarily, but maybe from engineers and people with more of a technical background who might play clarinet or something as a hobby, mm. um, who might who would make these who are where is where these innovations are going to come from, because they kind of have a a perspective from outside the musician's world. So, and I, I wonder how many uh, of the people actually making instruments uh, nowadays are, are uh, musicians themselves. 
I mean, what I usually see is um, a lot of what I, what happens is uh, musicians will kind of go into repair, and then from repair they will go into making their own instruments. Like, uh, like I think Tom Ridnor kind of did this. Uh, I can't think of any good examples off the top of my head, but yeah, we like um, most of your like repairmen and uh, instrument manufacturers have more of a music and repair background. But I mean, again, as more as a uh, as these like uh, processes like three D printing and uh, access to uh, machined parts and, uh, and, uh, and manufacturing equipment it becomes more readily available, we might start to see more uh, a diverse group of instrument manufacturers. Yeah. I, you know, when, uh, when I knew uh, Guntram Wolf, uh, he was not a musician at all, which I found fascinating. He was an Egyptologist. <laughs> and so he, he, he got into uh, making instruments when he had to actually recreate uh, some ancient Egyptian instruments from a tomb for a museum display. Oh, that, that that's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I, I mean, I wonder. I mean, it, like the Fox Factory, you've been there, Richard. Or how many of those people mm -hmm. are bassoonists or oboists? Um, I mean, I I think with with the uh, with those sort of sort of businesses, I think a lot of times what happens is someone starts the business. They're a uh, performer or at least a musician, and then gradually over the years, it you know goes from one generation to the next. And there's not always a um, you know it, it's not like being a bassoonist is a genetic thing. Um, so. Um, I, I can't speak. Most of the people I talked to in the Fox factory were bassoonists and oboists. Um, but with a company that big, the the technicians, the the designers, the day to day people, they're not necessarily the ones making all of the calls. Nor should they be necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it it it's it's a company. They're responsible. The Fox Company is responsible, does a lot of good, and they're responsible for a lot more than the whims of some weirdos like myself. Um, you know, and like I asked them when I was there, so because they were showing off the new uh, maple oboes, and it's like, so how long before you come out with a maple de moray? And they just kind of leaned over and they said, "We would love to." You know, the the, the technicians would would love to do this kind of stuff. But if the money's not there, it's not there. That, that's something that's always surprised me is Fox is the only uh, double read company that does not produce a Demore. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm not going to badmouth Fox. I, I, no. I love Fox. They do so many wonderful things. Like, seriously, what other company could you go to and just say, oh, Give me uh, a couple of hundred of your uh, posts for uh, for your your instruments, and they're like, okay, sure, here you go. You don't have to jump through a lot of hoops or sign up for some, you know, authorized repair. Blah 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 blah. It's just, oh, you you want to do something with your instrument that you purchased? Sure, here you go. We would be happy to help. Helps that you own a Fox bassoon too. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, even even then, like when Chip Owen was there, uh, I ma I made it very clear when I was talking to him. It's like, look, I know I have a Mollenhauer contra bassoon, so please don't don't do any or uh, feel compelled to tell me anything if you're not comfortable with it. And he would just flat out tell me, look, I I'm going to help everybody I can, and I hope that one day you'll buy a better contra bassoon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with his uh, relative rankings of Fox and Mollenhauer controversies, but I, I appreciate that attitude. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he he's a great guy. He's like he's one of, he's one of those guys where you would send him a question and you would specifically word it to to infringe on his time the smallest amount possible. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like, okay, this is the one thing I would really like to know, and I'm just going to ask that. I'm going to uh, resist the urge to ask a whole bunch of other questions. And then he would respond with like a, a five-page email where he answers all the questions you wanted to answer anyway. Yeah, he just... I, I, I emailed him a couple times. Uh, the one thing I was asking about is the I and this is on an old email account that I don't have access to anymore, and I don't have the document he sent. But I wanted the to get some idea of how the uh, low C and D thumb keys for the right thumb worked, and I, he sent me the whole specs and mockups of it. Wow, I'm surprised they'd share that. That's pretty cool. It's, oh, I mean, I, 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 technical drawings they just freely sent me of like every kind of a, like it's a very tinker friendly program. Did yeah. we freeze? Uh, you you froze right. for a bit, but you're good now. Okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's. You know, all the big companies are out there really to make a profit. And and that's their job. That's their job, absolutely. And pushing stuff is kind of antithetical to what the companies are doing. Um, uh, per Richard, I kind of agree with you there on, on your comment on, on the chat room there. Uh, it seems more and more Dorico is probably going to be the winner of that. Uh, Finale, I I use Finale all the time. But it's glitchy. I, I use Finale too. I, I, whichever company comes up with a native Linux version, then, I, then I'll pay attention. Then I'll consider switching. But is is... As long as I have to stick with Mac OS, I'm going to stick with the program I already know, which is Finale. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so back to that. Uh, you know, I, th I always think from the point of view, kind of first as a composer, as, you know, uh, one would expect. You know, and, Jared, did you just have a cat go across your screen? No, it's a bug on my camera. Oh, lovely. I got it. Okay. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I always think back to Richard Wagner in the Ring Cycle, where he basically willed instruments into existence. Like, that's some chutzpah there. Like, can I do that? I don't have that kind of charisma. You you have tried. Oh, I, I have, yeah. Um I, well, the only thing I've really done in that regard is the subconscious but only after I knew yeah. that uh, you are making it, it's going to happen. Uh, I have I have tinkered with ideas of including instruments like uh, a great bass bassoon or instruments an octave lower to the English horn or an octave lower to the bass oboe. Um, you know it. I could see potential from the composer point of view of those, um, whether or not they would be worth it. I don't know, but it's a, see, I guess, I guess from my point of view, I don't think there's anything wrong with considering the oboe and the bassoon families as complementary families. You know, they, I think there can be a middle ground between Oh no, they're completely 100% separate and, and you know they there has to be a full soprano to contrabass uh you know gamut for each of the two and you know oh they're the same thing. You know, like for me the the bass oboe and the the tenoroon kind of fit in that that kind of interesting extensions of that idea. But by the time you start getting into contrabass oboes or uh, altoons or sopranoons, I start to think you're gonna you're gonna uh, limit. It. I think the the families are gonna clash more than they complement each other. If that in that situation. Um, 
I don't know. It would. It. it it's an experiment waiting to happen. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I want if I want someone to make a contrabass oboe. Oh yeah. I want to. I want to see it. I'm. I'm not going to be the one to do it because you know I have my own pet projects. But I, I. I do want it to happen. But once again, I question whether or not it would be successful. What do you think, Jared? Should somebody make a contrabass oboe? I mean, I think it's just kind of one of those things where we kind of need to to test it out. We do, we just need to make one and kind of see what happens. I mean, regardless of whether it's successful or not, at least we'll we'll know then for sure. Um, now, whether anybody will actually build one, I I certainly hope so. But yeah, it's a, it's kind of one of those again, like the chicken and egg thing. Where uh, are we going to see it? Um, is it going to be written for? I mean, it's all things we'd have to figure out as we go along. Yeah, it it gets to that there's a tantalizing couple sentences in uh Richard Strauss's uh, at, um, uh edit uh, edition of the Berlioz treatise on instrumentation where he talks about having heard a contrabass oboe uh and said that it sounds nothing like a bassoon basically it doesn't share any of the characteristics it, it that's really the only tantalizing bit of information we have okay okay but it obviously sounds something like a bassoon oh yeah i mean yeah i think it um i think a lot of the difference would come between like the uh, the shape of the reed because i know the bassoon has more yeah. wide reed versus the oboe so i think a, a good place to start with an experiment would be to try and make an oboe reed that fit a bassoon or maybe a contra bassoon and kind of see how different the uh, the tone colors are and see maybe if there's some potential to that idea. Well, I can tell you the tone colors of a uh, oboe reed on a bassoon. It sounds like electronic feedback, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, that's a, obviously that's an oboe and not an oboe, uh, not a bassoon sized. Oboe. And the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, it, it's something that should definitely be explored. Um, I'm all for more information. I, you know, I I think less decisions sh should be made by our hunches and more by well, we tried it and now we know. Like, yeah, we all have our, our thoughts and our opinions and our inclinations about what the situation might be, and we have to be open to changing those in the in light of new evidence. I, but, I that I, I absolutely love love that approach. I mean, the scientific method. Be prepared to be wrong. You know, you know, you know yep. it's, it's kind of the Mythbusters uh, approach. Failure is an option. It's kind of like just throw uh, things at the wall and see what sticks, you know. Pasta. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that would... A, a giant bass oboe would definitely be um, so, uh, something, one of those potential instruments that, you know, would be built by like tinkerers like us. Yeah, but before we before we get the, the contrabass oboe, we have to straighten out the bass oboe mess, and that's a whole... Yeah. Well, I, so this is something that Richard and I, I talked about really heavily uh, last week, is... The first thing you've got to do with bass oboe is it's got to be more widely available. And there's not, a, there's never been an affordable version of it that could be easily accessible. Well, there's never been a single version, or okay, at least not in this century. There's never been a single version of one. You know, we it the whole the. I, I I have very strong opinions on the bass oboe thing, but it it's not have it's never been it's never really had an opportunity because what little repertoire exists is divided between the bass oboe and the hecophone, and you have players and performers and conductors and composers 
having very strong opinions about bass oboe versus heckle phone. And what we really need is just, we need an instrument that fills that role that both instruments were designed to fill bass oboe and the heckle phone were both designed to kind of fill that role of an octave below the oboe. We need it to be available. We need it. to, Yeah. <laughs> Well, I absolutely agree with that, but I would like to, one thing I was thinking of, so do we necessarily need a perfect bass oboe to make a contrabass oboe? Like looking at another instrument family, the flutes. So we have contrabass flutes, but they are by no means perfect. They're, they don't project very well. They have their own problems. Yet we still have lower flutes. We have the what's called the subcontrabass flute. Um, I don't think these that we necessarily need to fix the bass oboe before we make a contrabass oboe. I think we can still experiment with these lower instruments without kind of like jump over the, the bass oboe. Just, um, I mean, just yeah. even just as an experimental instrument. Well, I guess I'm th just thinking from an orchestral point of view where the bass oboe is an instrument that cur is currently written for that is not... May uh, it's not available. It's not made in large enough numbers. It's not accessible. To me, the base, as far as the woodwind world, the repertoire that's out there, the the bass oboe is the largest deficiency because it's an instrument that is written for but is not available. Yeah. Largely, yeah, yeah. And and one of the big issues comes in that bass oboes, by and large, are played by oboists, and hecklephones, by and large, are played by bassoonists. So, you know, case in point, uh, if you hire a hecklephone player to play a part in the planets, you also have to hire an oboe player because there's two movements in the planets that that part has to go to oboe. So, so you've, you know, I mean, from a monetary standpoint, the orchestra would lose money. Mm hmm. I mean, a lot of these more like uh, exotic instruments could also be just instruments that uh, musicians just purchase as something that they, something to stand out. Like, for example, the contrabass sax. I mean, we really don't have a lot of competent uh, bass sax players, and we bass sax is really not seen too much, although it's becoming more common. But yet we still have musicians who are adventurous enough to go out and play contrabass sax. And I think if they, if they were more readily available, they would probably be more popular. But I guess yeah, but thing is... Yeah, but the bass oboe kind of exists in that awkward range where it's expensive, but it's not quite impressive. Yeah, like, absolutely. It, it, if you if you show a you know just random person off the street a bass oboe, they're not going to look at it and say, "Wow, it's a bass, it's a big oboe." They're going to look at it and say, "It's eh, a weird looking clarinet." In a literal sense, the contrabass saxophone has sex appeal. Yeah, it, I mean, absolutely. It, it's dominating. So, you know, you have to factor in some of these elements of drama. What effect is this going to make? So we need to give the bass oboe like 20 feet of dummy tubing, kind of like spiraling above their head and doing all this kind of weird stuff just so it you know it, it looks as impressive as it is and i wonder if uh with something like the hecklephone if it wasn't designed to also be impressive looking because a hecklephone is much more impressive looking than a bass oboe well if, if for no other reason than the you know the person has to sit on an awkward chair just to play it yeah when you played it uh, this week, I guess, or last week, um, uh, did you have to sit on a higher chair? No, I. but I, I played it kind of like Alphorn style, like kind of sticking out in front of me at an awkward angle. Mm. Um, if I were actually performing it, I'd play it on a stool. Okay. I know that uh, Tom Henniker plays it off to the side and backwards. Mm -hmm. Weird. Like, uh, like a saxophone yeah yeah i think um, he, last he makes uh, last vocals for it though so i bet he made a vocal specifically with that angle in mind mm. uh, yeah that makes sense mm -hmm. 
last time I played the planets with where they brought in a bass oboe player, um, she actually had to play it where the instrument was off the riser. So she she scooted forward so that she was on the riser, but the instrument was on the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when uh, Mikey was here, uh, we did a master class at UNT, and they're playing the planets. I don't know. There's sometime this semester, I don't think they played it yet. And we uh, met up with the, the girl who was going to play it, who was a little bit on the short side. And, you know, she it, it was pretty much resting on the ground. You know that it, that particular instrument is at such an awkward length that you know you can't really make it any longer, or it's going to go into the ground. Yeah, and that is one nice thing about the lupophone. It's a very the the ergonomics that they chose, the 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 shape of it. It's very well done. It it feels very natural to play. Uh, yeah, and, and from what I understand, though, the, the the main caveat on that is the ergonomics on the extra thumb keys are not good. Yeah, but, I mean, let's face it, you use those for, you know, one solo in one piece, and they don't really have to be. Yeah. I mean, you can really argue that even, like, the uh, the extended range on many low-C bass clarinets is also not really ergonomic, but again, yeah. we don't really use those notes all the time, so as long as they're there and we can play them when we need one, then it's pretty much all we need yeah although what, what was it we, we were playing uh prokofiev romeo in uh uh juliet last season and the bass clarinet player was uh she she was mentioned talking about man if i realized this piece had this many uh uh low c low d stuff i would have um i would have had my instrument worked on just because sliding all of that all, all of that thumb stuff from like the because, I mean, it's in that register constantly throughout the piece. And th that piece is pro and pieces uh, of that same era are probably the reason that uh, low-C bass clarinets became common. Uh, but it was really only the Russians who were writing down there. Nobody else did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, anyway, it, we've been going two and a half hours now. Um, I think it's it is about time to wrap up, and I know Richard just messaged me that you've got an early morning gig. Um, it's ten o'clock here. It's eleven o'clock for Jared. Oh, yeah, yeah, gotta gotta play some film music for some fifth graders tomorrow morning. Oh, what film music mm -hmm. you playing? Uh Batman, Sweet, Star Wars, Avatar. Do kids know Avatar? No, like, nobody knows Avatar yeah. anymore. Yeah, every everyone saw it and then everyone forgot it. Yeah, it, um, it, it somehow no, not, made two point seven billion. It, everyone saw it, everyone loved it, and then everyone forgot it. Uh, right. What else are we doing? Back music from Back to the Future, which I appreciate because it actually. I know this is going to be a, a a weird thing to talk about. It's written with flats and sharps as appropriate. As opposed to, you know, a lot of this film score, it's like they just, they use inharmonics with no rhyme or reason. It's just like, well, that's a B, so we must notate it as a B. Even if it came after an E flat and a D flat and is followed by a B flat. So, so I, I to follow up on that, I was talking with my, uh, uh, one of my orchestration friends who uh, does a lot of studio stuff. That's actually considered standard, and... Yeah, you're not, I hate it. Yeah, I hate it. For um, studio stuff, you are not allowed to put in double sharps or double flats. <sighs> Even if it makes like, sense, it's it you they they won't allow it in the studio. Yeah, and you get all of these parts that just they don't make any co coherent sense. I. I trust me. It, I, I I think I've complained about it on orchestration online enough. It's it's a pretty big pet peeve of mine. Yeah, you know, it's like you're clearly in G sharp minor. That's clearly a leading tone. Give me an F double sharp. 
Yeah, and, and this is a very different mindset between a studio musician and an orchestra musician. They really are trained differently. Well, but, but for me, it's... You, you don't need to, you need to know more than just the note. You you, you want to know the context. Yeah, and, but, but for the studio, it's not about the player. It's about the person in the recording booth that needs to be able to read it quickly. And, uh, and, yeah. It, it, anyway, it's, sorry. It's, that, uh, that was a whole unnecessary rant based on, uh, on nothing other than uh, Silvestri actually uses F flats as appropriate and it makes me happy. <laughs> he's one of the few film composers who actually knows what he's doing. Mm. Well, I mean, I would say John Williams definitely knows oh, yeah, what he's no, doing. No. He, but, John but Williams sometimes is, the music the like the, the the music is prepared in a way that just baffles me. Yeah. It's like You'll be playing simple parallel chords with three bassoons, and then you'll look over at their parts, and they have like a D sharp, and you have a B flat, and it's like, okay, like yeah, we're playing we're playing the right notes, but it would be nice to you know also have some context of the harmony. Yeah, well, that's uh, one thing in the studio. Nobody ever sees that. You only ever see your part. You don't. You're not. You don't have time to analyze the harmony. Well, yeah, but you don't have to. You don't have to take time to analyze the harmony if the person next to you has a major third below you or a major third above. Yeah, you just glance at it. If oh. if it's a whole bunch of inharmonic respellings for just to avoid an F flat four measures later, then oh no, I completely agree. I completely agree with you. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate, and that's the why oh, no, Hollywood no. Uh, does that, but. Anyway, guys, I think we do need to wrap it up. Um, it's bedtime for some of us. It's been dark for a while. Well, I mean, the time changed. I, I'm pretty sure it was dark at like five here. Yeah, it's been dark for like six hours. Yeah. So, all right. Um, I think we've kind of dwindled down on the, the questions. That is super long. Um Definitely a lot of fun, guys. Uh, we'll have to look at doing it again yes. sometime. Yeah, great stream. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more focused next time on you know, one or two topics. That way, we can uh, <laughs> maybe maybe, I, maybe cut it down to ninety minutes. Maybe so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't expect to go two and a half hours, but. But anyway, guys, it has been uh, super fun. Um, and uh, we'll talk to you guys later. See you later. Thanks, right. everyone, for watching. All right.